can't tell you how many times I've looked at that verse over the last week, and each time is more powerful, and just now it was again. So this evening we continue our Lenten worship series based on the hymn, My Song is Love Unknown, the second verse of which we just sang, as well as our scripture readings. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for sending your precious Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior, who has reconciled us to you, our loving Father. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to open my mouth with your words and to open our ears to hear your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So a little background for you this evening. The hymn, My My Song is Love Unknown, the subject for our meditation this Lenten season, was written in 1664 by Samuel Crossman who was a Puritan minister in England at the time. During an exile from the Church of England, he wrote these words, not as a hymn, but as a poem. It was first published in 1664 in Crossman's pamphlet, The Young Man's Meditation. It was then published as an Anglican hymn in 1684 after Crossman had rejoined the Church of England, but two years after his own death. The most common tune for my song is Love Unknown is called Love Unknown and is the one we sang this evening. It was written by organist John Ireland in 1918 and was reportedly composed in 15 minutes on the back of a menu over lunch one day at the request of fellow organist and composer Jeffrey Shaw. Ireland's tune was credited with bringing the hymn out of obscurity into which it had fallen during Victorian times. And the hymn has historically been used on Good Friday and has also been a fitting closing hymn for the season of Lent leading into Holy Week. And it's a wonderful hymn for us to focus on uh, during this Lenten season. So we just, bless you, we just sang verse 2 of this hymn and it bears repeating. He came from his blessed throne, salvation to bestow. But men made strange, and none the longed for Christ would know. But, O oh, my friend, my friend indeed, who at my need his life did spend. At my need his life did spend. We're all a needy people, aren't we? We as humans are normally and inherently focused on our own needs, the things we need to survive and and to flourish. Then there are also our wants, those things that we don't necessarily need, but those things we want to make life more comfortable. And so very often we, we confuse our needs and our wants, don't we? We as humans are also inherently very self-centered and also very self-ish. We always need to make sure that our wants and needs are satisfied above all others. And that selfishness, that self-focus, self-glorification, is exactly what the devil used to tempt the first man and woman in the Garden of Eden. We read in Genesis 3, The devil said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Be like God. And thus began the long, sinful, and deadly march of humankind through history. But also, right then, there there came a human neediness of a completely different kind our need for a Savior. 
a savior from our own selfishness and sin. Moses wrote that the devil said, you will not surely die. But we heard this evening that the apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians concerning our condition, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Paul continues, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved, he said, and raised us, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Again he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. What great news we have through our friend and brother and Savior Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus did exactly the opposite of selfishness. He saved us and reconciled us to our Father in heaven in spite of and completely covering our sinful nature with his precious blood and sacrifice. So what are we to do with this amazing gift? Well, Jesus said in our gospel reading this evening, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Love one another. In his great commandment, Jesus also said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We are to turn Jesus' love for us outward to those around us. I said earlier that humankind is inherently needy and inwardly and selfishly focused. And unfortunately today, most people don't don't know just how needy they are, needing a savior from eternal death and damnation. They don't know our savior, Jesus Christ, and his amazing love for them. But we have come to know intimately this love unknown, and we can share this love unknown with those around us. So I ask all of you this evening, look for those in need, those who are needy, that are all around us. Figure out with the help of the Holy Spirit how you may be able to help them with their earthly needs. And then share with them how their loving Savior has fulfilled their eternal need. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen.